Okay. Hi, and welcome to the tray setups for a composite restoration. Uh, right now we're set up for a class one, which is a posterior occlusal, or we can do a class five, which is either anterior or posterior on the cervical third of the buccal, facial, or lingual. So to start out with, we always wanna make sure that we have our PPE. Here we have a pair of non-latex, non-powdered nitrile gloves. We have our face mask. We have two sets of glasses, one for you and one for the patient. We have a patient bib and a patient bib clip, okay? Now, after you set the whole tray up, it's always advised that you cover up the tray with your patient bib just to uh, ease the patient's anxiety of seeing any of those scary instruments that are about to go in their mouth, okay? All right, so going forward, um, what we have here is our main dental tray right here, okay? So we have our basic setup, which is going to be our mirror. Um, we have our cotton forceps, and we have our perioprobe perio and our explorer, okay? Um, that's our basic setup. Now over here on the dental assisting side for the dental assisting basic setup, we have our air water syringe, okay? We have our HVE for the high volume evacuation. And then we also have our low volume evacuator or our saliva ejector, okay? This one is lined with the copper wire so we're able to twist it and whatever, okay? All right, good. Now, the next things on here are going to be our high-speed handpiece, okay? This one, um, it's very easy to plug in. We just, it has a bunch of prongs on the bottom, has the motor built inside of it, okay? It's slightly curved, that's how we can tell it's the high-speed, okay? And we just take the prongs and match them up with the holes here, and then we just screw it on, okay? Now, our low-speed straight handpiece, um, is going to just be the motor, okay? So it's gonna have this strange little post on it, and then again, it's going to have the connections for the air on the bottom here, and um, this is what will plug into your line, okay? The same thing, just match the holes up with the holes in here, and twist it on. Now for a carries restoration, we always wanna make sure that we have what's called a contra angle, okay? This contra angle holds latch burrs, which um, in, as you can see here, this little device, this little latch kind of pops out. Once we put the burr in, then we close it and it latches tight, okay? This is uh, very easy to assemble here. We just wanna make sure and just press it on until you hear a light click, okay? Now the tricky thing with this is you always wanna make sure that the motor is either going all the way forward or all the way reverse. If this is sitting in the middle, this motor will not work, okay? So always check, double check that before you start any of the procedures. Okay, uh, the next things that we have on here are going to be the topical anesthetic, okay? In this case, we have a delicious strawberry. Uh, we also want to make sure that we have some two by twos and a cotton swab, which will be used to apply the topical anesthetic. Okay, um, as far as the rest of the hand instruments go, we have our plastic instrument right here. Okay, as you can see, there's a flat curved edge on one side, and then this one kind of goes a little bit more uh, horizontal in its curving shape like an L and that is what's called a plastic instrument, okay? Doctors usually have a different name for all their instruments. Hopefully you'll find one that has the same names that we use here. Next, we have a condenser. Sometimes they're called pluggers as well, so you can see the, the cylindrical shape on the bottom here, okay? Same on this side. They come in all different sizes as far as that goes. Sometimes these are wider, sometimes they're smaller but these are used to pack in the flow or the packable composite um, for any restoration that we'll be using packable on, okay? And then the next thing that we have here is a ball. So right here we have a little ball right here. And then on this side we have a football. It looks just like a football. This is used for burnishing, okay? We use these to burnish the interproximal surfaces, mesial or distal, 
when doing any type of uh, class two caries operation or procedure, excuse me. Um, and sometimes doctors like to use them as pluggers as well for class one or class five. So it's always handy to have one of those out as well, okay? Now, when we go into the burst setup here, okay, for a composite caries restoration, we have several different burrs and I've gotten out um, quite a few different ones. Okay, we have the differences of a latch burr. As you can see, there's this little latch at the bottom here. And then we also have friction burrs, which um, aren't gonna have anything on the bottom. The shaft is just flush and it goes straight up and down, okay? Now, with uh, Carrie's restorations, what we have is going to be a number two round burr. And I don't know if you can see that. Let me zoom in here. It's going to be a little tiny round top there. If you can see that, I'm trying to get in close here. All right, good. Okay, so you can see that round burr right there. This is a number two friction grip round burr. Okay, and then we have a four. These go in increments of two. Okay, you can see that right there. Oh, it's round on the end there. Excuse me, this was a uh, number six latch burr, round latch burr. There's the latch. That's a number six. Okay, and then right here we have a number four friction grip, round burr. Okay, those are the three round burrs that you'll want to have. You'll also want to make sure that you have a flame burr. Okay, this is medium or excuse me, fine grip. And you can recognize that by the red stripe on it. Okay, red is fine, yellow is ultra fine, and blue is medium coarse grit on the ends here. So that is a flame burr. We also wanna make sure we have a medium grit football carbide burr, as you can see there. That's a football carbide burr. Next, we're gonna have our 330. Okay, kind of looks like a little um, condenser on the end, but it, it just cuts shape and every, or cuts and shapes and uh, takes decay out of the way. Okay, it almost looks completely straight. And then we have our 557, which is the same as the 330, it's just longer. When we go microscopic on these, they have different types of shapes on the blades. Uh, this one has more of like a teeth action on it. And then we're also gonna wanna make sure we have a latch polishing stone burr. Okay, these come in all different colors, blue, red, yellow, green, white. In this instance, we have a white stone polishing burr. Okay, some additional ones that doctors may use are going to be a um, diamond burr. Okay, this is a fine grit diamond burr. There's actual diamonds in here, but not enough to make you rich. And then we also have, some doctors like to use what's called a disc burr, okay? If you're never sure, just think of this as a foot or as a Frisbee disc, okay? So you can see that this is a diamond disc burr. All right, and then we have all of those on our magnetic burr block, okay? So those are the burrs that we're gonna wanna use for any type of caries restoration, okay? I also have on here a bite block, okay, or a mouth prop, just depending on your office and what they like to call it. Uh, it does the same thing, it just helps the, the patient keep their mouth open and for something for them to rest their, their mouth on if their jaw gets tired, okay. They come in two different sizes, there's an adult size and a pedo size. <clears throat> pedo is typically used for women because women have uh, smaller mouths than men. Um, but if you're not sure, just kind of take a look at the person's overall features and um, if you're not sure what size, it's, it's never a bad idea to get out both sizes, okay? So that's, a, that's the bite block. Those also come in several different colors and uh, shapes as well. Um, all right, and the next thing that I have on here is going to be, these are called cotton rolls, okay? Uh, there's some doctors that like to use these specifically, uh, and you'll you'll get to know how many that they like. But it's always a good idea to have at least two or three of these out at the beginning. These are used for isolation to keep the tooth dry whenever we start bonding and primering, 
and etching the teeth, okay, after we prep it. And then we also have a cheek guard, so if we're working in, on any posterior teeth, it's always a good idea. Uh, posterior, upper, maxillary teeth, we always want to make sure we have a cheek guard. Sometimes these come with a silver lining on uh, one side, but you always want to put the white side towards the cheek and that helps absorb uh, extra saliva and liquids and it also holds the retracts helps retract the cheek back away from our working surface okay so that's always a good idea to have out again maxillary posterior teeth these are used for anterior maxillary or mandibular teeth okay all right so the next thing on here is going to be our syringe okay we have a straight syringe right here and this is the most common one used in uh, general practice dentistry. When you get into oral surgery, there's uh, sometimes you can use curved syringes and stuff like that. But in this instance, we have a straight syringe, okay? They're plunger activate or spring activated plungers. So this will just pop back in there once we load it, okay? You also wanna make sure you have your um, anesthetic. Okay, some doctors like to use two or three, some doctors like to use one. The most common one used is going to be septicane. Okay, septicane does have epinephrine in it, but it's not as strong as lidocaine. Okay, lidocaine also has epinephrine in it. The generic name for septicane is articaine. Lidocaine is going to be lidocaine all the time. Now, if somebody has um, a heart problem or high blood pressure or anything like that, anything to do with the heart, we don't want to use epinephrine on them, okay? So what we would use is what's called carbocaine, and that is an anesthetic without epinephrine, okay? And then um, along the same lines as lidocaine, on the higher end of the epinephrine side is going to be marbocaine, um, which we don't hold here in our office, and that's typically used for oral surgeries or for uh, really tough extractions, okay? So those are gonna be your anesthetics. It's always a good idea to put one loaded Okay, with your cap needle and then an extra one either on the tray or off onto your clean surface if you're not sure if you're going to use it or not. Okay, now if we are working on the maxillary teeth, what we want to get is a 30 gauge short needle. Okay, needles are always double sided. Okay, this side goes inside of the syringe and then this side right here is what goes into the patient's um, nerves, okay? So this short needle is 30 gauge, meaning that it's um, that's the gauge around, and then short, obviously, because it's short, okay? So let me show you the differences here. So that's our short needle used for maxillary, and then we have our long needle used for IA blocks, inferior alveolar nerve blocks for the mandibular teeth. No matter what teeth that we're using, doctors will typically always do an IA block, um, which is towards the back of the mouth for the mandibular teeth, okay? So you can see the, the major differences here between those, okay? This is a 27 gauge, meaning it's thicker around, long needle, okay? And then this is a um, 30 gauge short needle, okay? So you can see the differences there, bottom, top. All right, very good. You always wanna make sure to cap these, okay? Not the way that I'm doing it. You always wanna scoop and cap, but uh, these are clean needles, so that's okay. These are used for demonstrations. All right, okay. So now moving into the dental materials, okay? So the first things first, we wanna make sure that we apply topical anesthetic. This usually lasts anywhere from seven to 15 minutes, depending on the strength. So we average roughly about 10 minutes. So if you put this on, um, you want to make sure the doctor's in the room within 10 minutes to um, put the local anesthesia in, okay? So uh, then after that, we're, the doctor will come in and anesthetize, and we will rinse and suction with our saliva ejector and our air water syringe, okay? Once the patient becomes numb, then obviously the doctor's gonna start drilling, okay? They typically start out with their high speed. Most doctors will load up their own, um, their own burrs of what they like. And then to do more uh, defined refinement is going to be used with the, um, the, round, the, the latch round number six is usually gonna be used in this guy um, to widen out and get rid of the rest of the decay, okay? This is your slow speed. 
After that, we want to go ahead and uh, rinse out the tooth and then dry it. And the first things first is we're going to be using this blue stuff right here, which is called Etch. Okay, so we have our Etch here. Uh, these are one-time use tops here. Okay, so we always want to make sure that these are being replaced after the procedure. Okay, so I always make sure that these work by just squirting a little bit on there and then I'll hand it to the doctor. Okay, the edge stays on for roughly about 20 seconds and then we'll want to rinse it and suction all that up, being careful that none of that edge gets anywhere else on the patient's uh, tongue or, or throat or anything like that. Okay, then after that, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using the bond and or the uh, primer, excuse me. So in this case, there's several different types of materials, okay? So there's some doctors that like to use a brand called Aquia, and they have their very own bond and primer. Um, there's some doctors that like to use a uh, flowable composite, which is a, a composite resin, which it doesn't really matter what type of primer and bond that you use so long as it's compatible with, with that. Aquia is a glass ionomer, and so therefore it needs its special etch primer and bond, okay? But in this instance, we're gonna be doing this cavity with a com flowable composite. Um, and so therefore we could either use this clear filled, which is a primer here, so it's individual, and then bond, okay? So you would just take that off and you would squeeze one into each one, okay? Um, or there might be an office that likes to use the bond and the primer mixed together. This is called meta P and bond, which is uh, like, again, I said primer and bond mixed together. So you would just do a couple drops of just the single one, okay? So let's say that we're working with the clear fill, okay? Uh, if you're not sure, it's 20 seconds of air, 10 seconds of curing here, okay? And we would put the primer in, and then we would get our micro brush, and this is our bond and primer holder with a black lid because this does set up and cure with just light. Okay, so we would take our primer, give that to the doctor, they would put that into the tooth, and then we would put a lot of air on that to make sure that it stays really dry, okay? Um, while that is all going on, we have isolated the tooth already to make sure there's no saliva or anything getting on this tooth, okay? Once we etch it, if the tooth gets wet, we have to start over, okay? So we always wanna make sure that that stays nice and dry. So the primer would go on, we do about 10 seconds of air, okay? And then after that, the doctor would ask for the bond. And we'd get the bond and we'd give the bond to the doctor. He'd put the, doc the bond in, okay? It's the same process except for with this stuff, except that you don't do them separately. You just do it in one. Once the bond goes on, then we wanna make sure that we're curing it, okay? You wanna get one millimeter away from the tooth. Now you don't actually wanna to touch the material because you can indent it or distort it but you wanna get as close as possible, typically right about, um, right about that close. The closer you are, the stronger this cure is going to be. Cure means that it just takes a liquid and it turns it into a hard substance, okay? So then we would cure it for roughly about five to 10 seconds, just depending on the, on the um, suggested use of, of your material. Okay, after that, then the doctor will ask for the flowable composite. Okay, now again, one-time use uh, tips with these. So again, um, this one's clearly stuck on there, but anyway, so these come off and this is just another brand of flowable. Okay. So you can see that they come in lots of different brands, lots of different types. Uh, this is the one that the doctors like to use here, which is the 3M ESPA fill tech bulk fill. Okay. Uh, but there are different types. Now you always want to make sure that you're getting the right shade. Okay. So particularly on front teeth, you want to make sure that you're matching the shade of their tooth correctly. Otherwise, they're going to be walking around with a half brown tooth and half white tooth. Okay, and that never looks aesthetically pleasing. So this one is A1. This one is a universal A1 and B1. Okay, A1 and B1 are typically uh, right about the same. There's not a real noticeable difference. Okay, um, so this would be your flowable. Okay. Now in the instance, uh, or then we would go ahead and, and put that in and then we would go ahead and cure it, okay? Now, as you can notice, there's some other things that are on here that we really haven't quite explained yet. So let's say that the doctor is drilling and he goes to, he or she goes way too far, okay? 
and exposes the pulp. Now we know that the pulp has a blood and nerve supply and that's never good to expose it if we're not doing a root canal. Okay, so what we would have to do is cap that pulp off and make sure that um, you know that they're they're taken care of as far as that goes because once we start putting this material on it's going to be really painful to that pulp if we don't cap it off. So in that instance there's several different materials that you can use. One of those is Vitrobond. Another one is um, is Dical or calcium hydroxide. Dical is just the brand name for it. Vitrobond, these are liners, okay, that will go in before you put anything else on to make sure that we're not putting material directly on the pulp, okay? So that may be something that you may have to use, okay? If you use something like that, which is a toothpaste system, you would also have a paper mixing pad, and then you would make sure that you have a spatula. Typically, you want to work with a plastic spatula, um, and some, in some cases, it's okay to use a metal spatula like we have here. But if, as you can see, if you use a metal spatula, you can get quite a bit of buildup on these with those liners and those cements, okay? Um, so plastic spatulas are, are a little bit better. I also have an extra pair of cotton forceps here. Um, with these cotton forceps, you, make, you wanna make sure that they're not going onto your dirty tray, which is over here, okay? These are used for extras, such as if you need to get into the drawers, or if you need to reach for something um, that's you don't want to touch with your dirty hands, you would use these, okay? Now another thing that we have on here, these are cotton pellets, okay? You can see here uh, that these little tiny guys are basically just a cotton roll put into little tiny snowballs, okay? Uh, these are used to apply what is called hemol or formal cresol. Uh, hemol is a coagulant agent so if somebody is bleeding really bad such as if they have really bad periodontal disease or gingivitis excuse me and you're doing a class 5 uh, filling and that that gum won't stop bleeding and you can't keep this the area dry then we would use this hemol applied with these cotton pellets to press on there and coagulate that blood to keep it dry enough for us to move forward okay um, so that would always be something good to have if you notice that the person does have really bad gingivitis. This comes in several different forms. There's also a paste form and a gel form called hemodent, okay? Anything with heme in it stands for blood, okay? So you just think, okay, I don't want blood. I'm gonna grab something that says heme in it, hemol or hemodent, okay? All right, the next thing on here is, let's say that the tooth is very, or the uh, filling is really, really deep, okay? and we need to put something other than flowable. Flowable is used mostly for shallow uh, surfaces such as, again, a class five or a class one, but in the instance that that class one goes really deep, we need to pack and build up those walls again. This is packable composite, okay? Usually comes in little capsules, just like this. Again, it's gonna have the shade on it, okay? This one is A2 and it says it right here on the tip. Okay, you can see that right there. And then we also have our composite gun, which just looks something like this, okay? And then you just pop that in, and you're done, okay? This has the versatility of going in any direction, so you can still hold it and go into maybe a tighter surface that you're not able to reach into, okay? So it's very ergonomic in that way. Okay, again, this is your composite carries restoration tray set up um, typically for a class one and a class five. We'll be showing you the additional uh, material and instruments you'll need for a class two, three, and four. Okay, so for a class two, class three, and class four carries restoration using composite, we are going to have the exact same tray set up except we are going to be adding a couple of things. Okay, for a class two, we're gonna jump into um, talking about the Tolfelmeyer and the matrix band right there, okay? What we wanna use to isolate that tooth after we prep the tooth is going to be what's called a Tolfelmeyer and a matrix band, if I can pick it up, okay? So here's your Tolfelmeyer and your matrix band, okay? We also wanna make sure that we have some wooden wedges, okay? 
Here's our little wooden wedges right here. Okay, you can see those. They're shaped in a triangle. Okay, so you can see those. These are gonna go into the um, intercostal space of the teeth, okay? All right, so, um, and then for a class three or four, which is an anterior, mesial, distal, or both for class three, or mesial, distal, and incisal is going to be class four, we wanna make sure that we're using a mylar strip, okay? These are a clear mylar strip, they come very long, so you may want to add some scissors to this tray setup and cut these in half, okay? Again, this is going to go interproximal, either mesial or distal um, on whichever tooth that you're using. And in some cases, you will be using a uh, wooden wedge as well to hold that in, just depending on the doctor, okay? So I'm going to show you how to apply these, okay? Um, here's our little typodont right here. Say hello. hello. Um, we want to, it's very easy. You just make a little loop. I don't know if you can see that right there. Okay, make a little loop and then you're just going to um, place it in until it gets into the sulcus, okay? So it's kind of hard to do if it's not up against me. Um, so I'll show you here. Again, we're gonna just be making a little loop. Can you see that okay? Make a loop and then we put it in and we make sure that we are pushing that all the way up into the sulcus, okay? And then therefore it just isolates those sides so we're able to keep those contacts right where we need them to, okay? So very easy in applying the mylar strip, okay? You load it in from the back to the front, push it up into the into the sulcus there, and then you can wedge either side, and I'll show you how to wedge those. You just take it, you fold it over, and you can either wedge it from the front or the back. Um, the anterior region is pretty easy to work with. Okay. Now as you can see, this little um, triangle right here is also the same shape as this intercostal area right here. So we wanna make sure that we're lining that up, okay? That we're not putting it in crooked like that or upside down like that, okay? We wanna make sure that it's lining up. We just use our cotton pliers just like that and then we can use the back of it to really push it in and secure it, okay? And then that holds that right there. And see, now you can see the reason why we would wanna cut those off because that's just Ridiculous. Okay, we don't want that on there. Okay, so that's really easy. Now to take it out, again, you just use your cotton pliers. You just go in, you remove uh, uh, you remove that wedge right there and just place it on and then this just slides right out. Okay, all right. So now for a class two, uh, these are a little bit more difficult to work with as far as the Tofelmeyers go. Now you do want to set this up prior to um, the whole whole procedure, okay? Now obviously a molar is going to be a lot bigger than a premolar, so your hole is going to be a, a little bit different whether you're doing a molar or premolar, okay? So there's two different uh, gadgets on here, okay? We have this gadget which moves the moves it slowly but surely, just the block up and down, okay? Everybody can see that right there, so that block, this big piece moves the block, okay? Now this little piece right here moves the screw, so you can see that screw is sticking out right there, it moves all along, okay? If I hold this big piece and I unscrew this right here, you can see that screw is starting to disappear. Okay, and you can unscrew the whole thing if you really want to, so sometimes these give you a little bit of trouble after being autoclaved. Um, so, you know, if you have to unscrew it and reset it, that's perfectly fine. Or if I hold it and then I screw it the other way, again, you can see that screw coming all the way towards that, okay? Now, this screw, um, its main purpose is to hold the mylar strip in this little slot that's right here, okay? So our mylar strip, the ends are going to be sticking out right here. 
and it's going to come up and it's going to form a loop either on this side or this side depending on which side of the mouth that you're working on okay so we want to always start with um, our block up close to our horseshoe here is what I'm going to call it okay and then again we want to make sure that this uh, screw is out now if you pull it all the way out Okay, we're not going to have any stability there, okay? So we want this to be in at least a millimeter or at least attached a little bit when it's in there, okay? So now we have a full solid piece. Now, uh, with these, uh, you just want to make sure that, first off, you're able to grab them and not fling them all over the place like me. Okay, and we want to, these come in several different sizes. <clears throat> There's pedo sizes. Um, there's, there are some that people use for anterior as well because they don't like to use the mylar strips. Um, this is what's called a, a size two my, or size two matrix band. Okay, these are pretty universal. Okay, when you start getting into uh, you know a lot of endodontics or periodontics and stuff like that, they might use a different type of strip. But most general practice doctors will just get a type two. Okay, now as we can see here, this is what's called a tapered edge. Okay. So you can slightly see it here, how it goes from small to big. Okay, so we have a bigger edge here than we do here. The hole here is smaller than it is here, and this is what's called a tapered, tapered edge, okay? Now that's the same way that our teeth go, right? Our teeth are bigger on the crown than they would be on the root, okay? Again, you know, they'd be bigger on the crown than they would be down here on the root. Can you see that? Okay, so that means it's tapered, okay? All right, so um, when putting this together, we want to make sure to put this in, fold it in half and make sure that it's even, okay? Can you see both sides there are even? Okay, what we do is we just slide it into the top right here, and then we just keep sliding it in until about a millimeter comes out of the back side. Can you see that? Just that one little millimeter sticking out just like that. Okay. So I took it from the top again. I'll do it again. Took it from the top. I just slid it in until I got about a millimeter out on the end there. Okay. All right. So now this is really tricky if you have small hands, okay? Luckily I have uh, big hands. So I'm gonna hold this piece in here with my thumb and my forefinger, okay? And as you become more experienced as a dental assistant, you'll learn how to become more dexterous and using all of, your, all of your fingers, okay? So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold this long piece and I'm gonna turn this screw to make sure that it tightens up. Okay, now I can't pull that out. Okay, now that's nice and solid in there and I have a loaded matrix band. Now, if we were to just leave this just like this, okay, we, we wouldn't be able to apply it to the teeth. Can you see that? See how this is getting in the way like that? Okay, so that's not good. So what we wanna do is take this and if we're working on this side, we want the flat edge to be against the tooth there, right? Because we want the tapered edge. We want it to be the small edge going down into the sulcus with the big edge coming out to the edge of the crown. We wouldn't be able to do that on the same side, okay? So we would have to switch it over to that side. Same for the top as well, okay? Hope that makes sense. All right, so let's say that we were working on that side on the patient right lower mandibular teeth, okay? Sometimes if you tighten it too much, you can just untighten it a little bit just so you're able to switch that over to the side. Now you can see my side loop there, okay? Um, now, again, we wanna make sure that that um, is tight, okay? That we're not able to pull that out. Now it's really important that you don't pinch this and that you keep it a loop, okay? Because if we pinch that, it creates a, um, a crease in there and then it's really hard to get it nice and flush on those interproximal surfaces. So we wanna make sure that we just have this nice flexible loop just like that and here you can really see the tapered edge as far as that's smaller and that's larger okay 
So we're going to be working on lower left or lower right uh, patient mandibular. So as you can see here, I haven't sized my loop at all. Okay, so it's just, it's really big. It's going to take me forever to put that in. Okay, these obviously aren't normal teeth size. Okay, um, your camera's on this side. This side on. Okay, so um, this is where it gets a little tricky, okay? So we want to measure our tooth out, okay? So I'm gonna be working on this tooth right there. Okay, and I want to make sure that I get this a little bit smaller. Okay, so I'm gonna start turning the big one. And as you can see, the block's starting to pull away from our horseshoe, which in turn makes our loop smaller. You can see that, how it's now pulling that through, okay? Every once in a while, you may need to just push that back in if it's starting to come out, okay? Um, and now I've made it a little bit too small, so I'm gonna go the opposite way. I'm gonna go the opposite way and make it a little bit bigger now, okay? So there's our Pokemire there. And then what I'm gonna do is work on this premolar right here, okay? and it just slides right in, okay? Now we do want to push it all the way down into the sulcus area, okay? This is obviously a lot easier on a typodont than it would be on a human, okay? But you'll get used to it with the more practice that you do, okay? So then I want to make sure that I'm tightening this up by creating a smaller loop, okay? I went the wrong way because I'm trying to do everything backwards. Okay, so as you can see, this is starting to tighten around the tooth, and it is down in that sulcus area, okay? It's wrapped around, it's in the interproximal areas as well, so you can see that. And notice that whenever I was tightening it, I kept my finger on top of it so it didn't slide out, okay? So now I want this to be nice and solid. This isn't quite solid enough yet for me. I'm not quite comfortable with that yet, so I'm going to go just a little bit more and tighten that just a little bit more. Now you have to be careful because if you over tighten this, there's several things that can happen. Either one, it's gonna slide out of your horseshoe here, or two, it's gonna break, okay? You can over tighten these and break them. But now it's nice and solid, okay? It's almost like an extension of the tooth. It's not flopping down, it's nice and straight. If I move it either way, you can see that this has been applied appropriately, okay? Now for the Tolfelmeyers, you have, to, if we were just doing a um, mesial uh, class two, we would only put a wedge on the mesial edge. If we were only doing a class, or if we were only doing a distal, we would only put it on the distal. If we were doing both, we wanna put it on the both. Now for this, the wooden wedges, um, you have to load them uh, lingually, okay? so. Again, you wanna make sure that this is not upside down, okay? So you wanna put your long pointy end down towards the tongue or up towards the palate, depending on which side you're working on, okay? And here, um, or excuse me, it would be the opposite way. I'm sorry about that. Um, you would on, always wanna put it towards the occlusal edge, okay? So again, let's say that we're working on a mesial, okay? And these are pretty tough to put in, okay? I mean, a lot of people don't have super open contacts, okay? But you don't wanna just put it in and then leave it, okay? You always wanna go in and make sure that you're pushing it in as far as it'll go. And yes, patients will feel this, okay? Even if they're numb, they're gonna feel that pressure, okay? But notice how far I was able to get that in, okay? It's really important that those are pushed in as far as possible. Okay, and I'll show you the one for the distal side as well. Again, I'm gonna put the top um, edge of my, of my long part of my um, triangle towards the top. Okay, I'm gonna hang on to it like that. I always use, like to use the curved section. Okay, and I'm just gonna pop that right in there and make sure I double secure it with the back of my cotton players, okay? Now, people are gonna bleed whenever you do this, okay? We're, we're basically putting little tiny splinters into, their, into the middle of their teeth, okay? 
Um, but again, my Tofelmeyer, it might be a little floppy going back and forth, but it's it's solid on there, okay? Now what the doctor can do is come in and finish the rest of the restoration, just like we would for a class one or class five. We would build back up the walls, we would burnish it, prime it, bond it, all that good stuff, okay? So that's the only difference between a class two and a class three carries restoration with composite. Um, would just to be adding either one of those. Everything else on your tray is still going to be the same. Okay. And as you work with the doctors, you'll get to know exactly what they want. And um, then you won't have to take out all the stuff. But to begin, this is what you'll want to do. Okay.